State versus Serena and Schaefer. I will note that the, the attorneys, both defendants, and the judges are now present. Good morning, everyone. All right, uh, when we left off Thursday, uh, <clears throat> we had uh, completed the playback of Ms. Linder's course examination, and you had further requested a readback <clears throat> of Mr. Wax's testimony. Um, I think the best way to go about doing this is if we involved um, Fran, the court clerk, and my law clerk, John, to read the uh, <coughs> respective questions and answers. Are we ready to go? Yes, sir. <coughs> okay, the stand, John. Again, Fran will read the questions, and my law clerk John will provide the responses. Okay? All right, proceed. Direct examination by Mr. Benedict. Mr. Wax, did you prepare a report in connection with this matter? I did. And in preparation of that report, did you review the report by Joseph Green? I did. And did you also review depositions taken in the civil matter? Yes. And at least up to the day of the trial, all statements and police reports in connection with the matter? Yes, I did. Now, I wanted to ask you, first of all, what's the difference between real property and personal property? Real property deals with the land itself. That is the only definition of real property. It's the actual dirt that is the land that constitutes real property. Anything that is not real property is personal property. Whatever is fixed to the real property goes along with the real property in connection with the sale. But I have had situations where the house or the building has been separately sold as personal property rather than real property. Now, in a transfer of property, be it real or personal, what is the writing required? New Jersey has something called the statute of fraud, which indicates that when you have a contract between parties in writing, you have a legal agreement and therefore you can enforce that agreement. Generally speaking, with certain exceptions, in real, in real estate, you need a contract. You need a writing. In personal property, you don't necessarily need a writing. It can pass by just by virtue of what is happening and how it's being handled. All right, so personal property can be transferred through an oral agreement? Yes. What is an estate sale? An estate sale is when you have assets that was previously owned by someone who has now died, and those assets are now being sold. It could be the real property of the person who has passed away, or it can be any of the personal assets of those of that person, which the range could be extremely long and large. It could be someone's wedding ring, it could be a picture, it could be any kind of asset that is other than the real property itself. Generally speaking, the sale occurs after the person passes away. Either it is transferred by someone's will, or it is transferred because we have laws in New Jersey called intestate laws which says who gets the property if you don't make a will, or if there's a specific writing with regards to the transfer of that property, either before or after the person's death. A couple of other proprietary questions. What is the meaning of as is in connection with the real estate transaction? In a real estate transaction, as is simply means that the seller is transferring the asset specifically the way it is at a particular point in time, that there's making no representations with regard to it. They are saying nothing about it, and the buyer understands that that particular item may or may not work, may or may not leak, as in a roof, may or may not be as expected in connection with what the buyers do. So generally speaking, as is simply means that it's buyer beware. The buyer takes whatever it is in whatever condition it's in. Now, in the absence of any written or oral agreement with regard to personal property, does the as is in a real estate transaction include the personal property? Generally, it does not. As is, as I said, really deals with the real estate itself. As is doesn't necessarily cause a transfer of the property. All right. Did you review the conduct of sale and the deed in this particular case? I did. Was there any transfer of personal property in either of those? No. In fact, the form was used, and the form where it says to be included or excluded was left blank. Now, can personal property be abandoned? 
Absolutely. And how does it become abandoned? Well, it's interesting. We have a statute in New Jersey, 4630C, which deals with how property can be ultimately abandoned and what it basically says is it says first, it defines what a finder is, and a finder is a person who has possession of this property. And then it deals with the issue of how one can abandon property and the words that are used. It can be lost, mislaid, or forgotten. And if any one of those three happens and someone comes along and finds that property, the finder is the keeper of the property. I'm sure as a child you have heard finders keepers. That's what it is. So in this particular case, if this property that you're asking about was found by someone and it was lost, mislaid, or forgotten, the finder is the owner of that property. Now, I want you to assume certain facts. Assume that between 1939 and 1965, members of the Abrams family lived at 1602 4th Avenue, initially Lewis and Estella Abrams. <laughs> Upon his death, it was owned by Estella. Upon Lewis's death, it was owned by Estelle. Subsequently by Estelle and Ann, and then sold by Ann Abrams in 1965. I want you to further assume that Estelle and Lewis had a son, Irving. I want you to assume that until the years of roughly 1933 through 1964, it was against the law to possess 1882 gold certificates. And I want you to further assume that a safe was discovered on the premises of 1602 4th Avenue. And within the state were business records of Abram and his son and 1882 gold certificates, which were secreted in a tin box which had a false bottom. Are you able to reach any conclusions as to whether or not this was abandoned property? And if so, by whom? Yes. One other additional fact is I understand it, that the safe was not affixed to anything. That it was either on wheels or was just standing on the ground. So the personal property, is that? Because there is something in real estate contract dealing with fixtures, Fixtures will go along with the real estate for safety reasons. For example, if I were to take a stove that was hooked up in the kitchen as part of the sale, as a seller, and I didn't hook up the gasoline property properly, or disconnect the gasoline properly, that could potentially blow up. So there are certain things that are deemed fixtures that are normally, because of the safety factor, are going to go along with the property. Something that is on wheels, such as that safe, is not a fixture. So the question becomes, when there is when there is a sale to this property, is that property included in the sale or not included in the sale? And if it's silent, then there is. There is nothing to indicate where it's to go or who it's to go to. It's up in the air. So if you move in and you find something that the seller left, you could assume that the seller left it, but that's all you can do. There was one other thing I wanted you to assume, and that's to assume that the seller or buyer in 2013, and you have seen the contract of sale, were unaware of the existence of either the safe or the certificates. Again, my question is, do you have an opinion as to whether this was abandoned property and why home? Well, first of all, you got to have knowledge that something exists. And as I understand this situation, the facts in this matter, neither the buyer or the seller at that particular time had knowledge of the existence of these gold certificates, or whatever it is in the safe. And under the statute, and based on the facts as I understand in this case, the safe was abandoned along with whatever the contents of it was because it was either lost, forgotten, or mislaid. There was no specific understanding between any of the parties as to who was going to receive this particular item, and therefore, it was up for grabs. Alright, and do you have an opinion based upon the assumptions I asked you to take as to who the prior owner of the property would have been? Who would have abandoned it? Based upon the information that I received from you and the depositions that I read, I understand that within that particular safe there were records of the Abrams family, and that the safe apparently either had been tried to be, to be opened or was not opened, whatever. Those records indicate that the safe at, that, at some point in time had to have been owned by the Abrams family because there were Abrams records in there. And I would also then assume for that purpose that whatever was in the safe was originally owned by the Abrams family. Alright, so upon someone finding those certificates, do you have an opinion as to who those certificates would belong to? Well, I think I indicated before, I think what happened was that Mr. Burke was not, not Mr. Burke. Do you have to refer to your report? I'm having a moment. The person who cleaned out the house? Mr. Schaefer. Thank you so much. Mr. Schaefer was requested to clean out the house, and he was told by Ms. Linder, just get rid of there were certain things that she indicated that she specifically wanted to keep or have, one of which I understand was a Michael Jackson doll. 
Otherwise, I think your testimony that I read in the deposition was just get rid of it. Just get rid of the junk. And so when Mr. Schaefer came along, he cleaned out that house, and one of the things he cleaned out was a city. Based upon that, let me have you make a couple of other assumptions. Assume during the negotiations of the contract of sale, the contract of sale and the deed, there was never any discussion between Ms. Linder and Mr. Burke about the disposition of the personal property. Okay. Would that in any way affect your opinion? No. It would probably reinforce my opinion, because if they, again, they had to have knowledge of the existence of those certificates, and I think they got the knowledge after the fact, not at the time that the certificates were uncovered by Mr. Schaefer. Just a couple of other questions. In real estate transactions, is a retainer agreement required? I'm sorry, say it again? In a real estate transaction, specifically the kind of real estate transaction we had here, would a retainer agreement have been required? Yes. The rules of professional conduct indicate that lawyers are supposed to have retainer agreements with clients who they have not previously represented. Is there any exception if it's an estate sale? No. Generally, there is no exception to that rule. The question, of course, is was there any previous representation? I have no other questions. Thank you. And then we have the cross-examination by Ms. Eifer. Mr. Wax, with regard to the safe itself, have you ever seen it? Have I ever seen it? Yes. No. Do you have any idea how large it is or how heavy it is? No. Do you have any knowledge of the specific location where it was found? Just from the testimony that I read that I heard it was in the basement. Okay. Apart from learning that it was in the basement from what you read, were you aware of any stairs or anything by which the safe would have to have been moved out of the basement? I would be having – I would have to make that assumption that if it's in the basement, it had to have – and it was removed. Unless there was an exit from the basement, there would have had to have been a set of stairs. But the answer is you don't know how easily or with what degree of difficulty the safe would be removed from that basement. You don't know what kind of equipment would be required. You don't know what the physical circumstances are. That is accurate. Okay. Now, with regard to the family records that you described, in fact, what is known? Because you have never seen any of the records that – these alleged records that were recovered from the safe. You have never seen any of them? That's correct. I haven't. And you said you read some depositions. Do you recall in whose deposition you read about the records that were found in the safe? I don't recall. Okay. Do you recall whose depositions you read? Yes, I do. Whose? I read Mr. Schaefer's. I read Mr. Burke's. I think I read Ms. Linder's. There were probably others, but those were the three that I recall. And it's your recollection that somewhere in all of those depositions and perhaps others, you read somewhere there were records belonging to the Abrams family? Yes. Do you know, in fact, that what was described were some canceled checks? I don't recall that specifically, but it is my understanding that there may have been canceled checks among the records, yes. And you don't really know anything else about any specific types of records beyond the mention of canceled checks, correct? I didn't believe that it was necessary or germane. Yes or no? Do you have any additional information about the nature of those records other than a specific description that they were canceled checks? Well, I don't even know that they were the canceled checks. Okay. So you don't know what they were? All I know is that there was a description of them in some of the depositions. There was a description in some of the depositions to the effect that there may have been some canceled checks that bore the name of the Abrams and Son. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Other than that, you don't have any direct personal knowledge? I don't have any recollection. Okay. Now, you have read the documents that are in the chain of title concerning the property located at 1602 4th Avenue in Asbury Park, correct? Chain of title meaning from the time the Abrams owned it? Well, from even before. Well, if you looked at Mr. Gravis' report, he sort of went into the predecessors in title who eventually the Abrams purchased the property from the HOLC Corporation. Right. I didn't go beyond what, in essence, was a foreclosure in 1934 when, in fact, when the Abrams acquired the property. Correct. In fact, the Abrams acquired the title to the property in 1943. I'm sorry. I reversed the numbers. Okay. That's fine. And from what you can tell in the chain of title, please correct me if I am wrong, from 1943 when Lewis and Estella Abrams purchased the property from the HOLC Corporation up until, I believe, 1958, title vested in Lewis, Abrams, and his wife, Estella. That is correct, except that I'm not – I don't remember when Lewis Abrams died because the title obviously passed to his wife at his passing. Right. So if Mr. Abrams passed in 1955, at that point in time, because they were tenants of the entirety, being husband and wife, and so designated on the deed, and there not being any additional agreements as to joint tenancies or anything like that, 
title would have passed to Mrs. Abrams? That is correct. Okay, and then looking again at the documents in the chain of title, we see that in 1958, Estella conveys the property from herself solely to herself and her daughter Anne. Correct. And that's in 1958? I believe so. Okay, and then subsequently, in 1965, because Estella had passed, Anne herself conveyed the property to Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Palmer? That's my understanding. And title to the property doesn't pass again from 1965 until 2013? <clears throat> By, I believe. By way of deed? Yes, by way of deed it didn't pass, but it did pass by virtue of three Palmer deaths. All right, let's put that to the side for the moment. In all that history, do you have any indication at all that the Palmers and Anna Abrams may or may not have had any agreement regarding a safe or any other personal items that may have been in 1602 or that I didn't see any testimony in this particular case that I reviewed that indicated one way or the other. So I mean, and Brandy, Granted, anything is possible, but there is nothing in the available record that affirmatively indicates that they never negotiated for that the state had been in the property before the Thomas purchased it, that maybe they were going to keep it. There's nothing to say that that fact did or didn't happen? That is correct. Okay, and there's nothing in the available record that indicates that there was a confluence of timelines for the checks, perhaps issued by Lewis Abrams and the son, for the business, and the container that was ultimately discovered to have the gold certificates hidden away. Those two things happened at the same time? It would be speculative on my part to decide whether that was true or wasn't true. I have no idea, no way of knowing. <clears throat> okay, and we have no way of knowing who, in fact, although many years ago, took that box with the hidden compartment with the certificates hidden away in a false bottom and put it in that safe. I saw nothing in any of the records that indicated it one way or the other. Okay, so other than knowing that at some point in time, some documents bore the name Lewis Abrams and Son and had the checks were in that safe, nothing else that confers ownership of the gold certificates upon the Abrams family. There's no other facts. Just the proximity of the certificates and the checks would lead me to believe that they were one and the same. But your premise is correct. I saw nothing in any of the facts in this case. Okay, now you were asked by Mr. Benedict, can personal property be abandoned? Yes. And I believe you answered in the affirmative. Yes. And then you were also asked with regard to a finder of abandoned property. Yes. And I believe you also referred to a statute. I did. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, that statute is in Title 46, which concerns real property. 46 colon 30C. And you recognize this book? Oh, yes. You're familiar with it? Oh, yes. And just for the jury, just tell us what that is. We don't see that book very much anymore because everything is online. But as an older practitioner, I handled those books many years. As have I. And this is the New Jersey statute annotated? Yes. So the statute in question is entitled Lost or Abandoned Property, and there is 46-30C-1, or 46 colon 30C-1. It's called a definition section, correct? Correct. All right, and there's three definitions, correct? Well, I'm going to show you. I know there is, there's at least one. One definition is finder. Okay, all right, and that's in subsection C? Correct. Now, subsection A. Yes. Would you believe me if I told you it defined abandoned property? Probably. Okay, all right, probably. Well, would you like to take a look? <clears throat> sure. Okay, just take a look at subsection A. Okay. There's a definition of abandoned property there. Yes. And, in fact, it says property, abandoned property, and that's in quotation marks, is property of which the owner has intentionally given up possession under the circumstances evinced intent to give up ownership. That's what it says. Okay, subsection B addresses lost property? Correct. Would you agree with me that the definition of lost property as contained in the statute is property that the possession of which has been parted with casually, involuntarily, or unintentionally, or which has been mislaid, left, or forgotten? I agree with you wholeheartedly with that. Okay, so the property that has been mislaid, left, or forgotten is subsumed within the definition of lost property. Correct. And then finally, subsection C, as you've indicated, refers to a finder, and it defines a finder as a person who acquires legal possession by exercising physical control over abandoned or lost property. That is also correct. Now, moving on, NJSA 46 colon 30C-2, helpfully entitled, helpfully enough, entitled finder of abandoned property ownership. Are we talking about abandoned property now? Abandoned property, and it says, a finder of abandoned property may assume ownership of it. Correct. 
I think you're looking at what says response to question number six incorrectly stated as number four. That's in fact what I'm looking at. That's what I thought. Thank you. 